Right, so hello and welcome to another Piston Heads video blog. Something a bit different today. I am here with Ray Kashera from GKN Drivetrain, is that the correct? GKN Driveline. GKN Driveline, who supply the very interesting Twinster system which underpins the Focus RS we are sitting in here, driving around this test track. So I'm going to attempt to not make Ray sick as we drive around <laughs> and demonstrate what he's done to this car. So I think probably what we would start with is what is the Twinster system and, and what are the common misconceptions people have about it? Sure. Well, starting off, the system basically is, uh, you know, this is a front-wheel drive car based, yep. obviously. Power transfer unit sends torque to the rear. And in the rear, it's controlled by two independently controlled uh, clutches. Okay. Okay, so yeah. traditionally, you would see a uh, clutch on the front of the axle. And that's how you would control the uh, torque flow front to rear. And would that be a Haldex type? It would be system? a Haldex style, or uh, let's see, TMW used to be uh, JTEC now. Okay. Also, GKN does similar ones too, but yeah, more, most traditionally you would see it as a Haldex one. Uh, and that would be a hydraulically driven one. All right. So in this case, we've got two independently hydraulically driven uh, clutches in the rear that control the torque flow not only from front to rear, but from side to side. Okay. So traditionally, with the other systems, you would have a differential in the rear. Yeah. You know, the torque goes where the torque goes. Yeah. In this case, we're telling the torque where to go each time. So there's actually no differential. There's no differential, exactly. Right. It's replaced the differential with two clutch packs. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So how did the system come about? What was the original? I guess you guys designed components to be used in lots of different cars. We do. What yeah. was the inspiration for designing the, the Twinster setup? Because I heard it was originally in the Range Rover Revoke. It is, so yes. Right? It's, just, it's very similar to the one that's in the Range Rover Revoke. Uh, you know, in this case, Ford actually wanted additional performance from it, so it's okay. got additional clutch capacity. Yeah. But the big thing that Ford wanted to have was uh, to add torque vectoring to it. Yeah. So in this case, what we do is we get an offset gear ratio front to rear. Okay. So that way, when the all-wheel drive system engages, it tries to overspeed the rear wheels. Okay. And it gives you, you know, traction for traction events, but really gives you a handling feel for, you know, when you're driving aggressively, like, uh, you know, going into some hot corners and coming out yeah. of them. So, you know, that torque vectoring is uh, what enables what we call the drift mode. You know, some of the other various performance uh, features you can feel you can get in this vehicle. Okay. And was that originally intended for the system, or was this a kind of a happy kind of somebody went, oh, hang on, I guess we could do this with it? I think it was uh, a combination of both, to be honest. Yeah. You know, it's one of these things where, you know, you can drive the Range Rover Evoke and get a feel for how stable the car can be. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of the handling benefits you can get. But then it was one of those what-if moments of, okay, what else can we wring out of this performance-wise? Yeah. You know, and adding that gear ratio offset really allows you to do some very special things. Yeah. So, why did, did, did the brief originally come from JLR saying they wanted this system, or did you come up with the system as a as an alternative to Haldex type systems? Yes, as an alternative, to be honest. So you yeah. came up with it first, yes. and then yeah. JLR went, oh, we well, I look at yep. that. Yeah. So we've got a... Uh, you know, in the current vehicle, we actually supply the standard drive as well, which has the Haldex system, but also do the uh, you know, Twinster in that vehicle. Okay. So, right. I think a lot of people saw that and said there's a lot of potential for this technology. Yeah. You know, not just for traction, but for handling, for yaw stability, for a lot of great things. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, with your work with, because we were discussing earlier how many of your systems appear in lots of different cars, mm -hmm. uh, JLR we know use your differentials a lot in the yes. uh, F-Type and yep. stars of their other cars as well. Yeah, there's they? a lot of vehicles that have. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's, sometimes it's easier to say who doesn't have our technology than okay. who does. Yeah, yeah. But this is completely different from anything in those cars. So it is. It's the only one that has the, the, uh, the gear ratio offset. And that's the crucial thing. That is the crucial. That's the, uh, the secret sauce to make the, uh, the torque vectoring really work. Okay. So, with the... Uh, Haldex system, is that only ever going to be reactive? So it needs an event, it needs slip of the front wheels before it Actually, can I would say almost engage. all of the systems now are preemptive. Okay. You know, so in the past that was kind of the case where you had to have some sort of traction event to really engage the system. Yeah. Uh, now they can be totally preemptive and uh, turn on based on driver intent, based on what the vehicle thinks you want to do. Yeah. Uh, based on what it knows about outside conditions. Okay. Okay, so... So I think, you know, a lot of our readers talk about Haldex quite disparagingly, but they're not necessarily. It's not necessarily fair to say that it's only ever a reactive. No, no, not at all. No, it's the, the newer systems in the past it was reactive. Yeah. The newer systems are preemptive as well. So that's what we're on now. We're on five now, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But as you say, 
the switch still gives you a right, it still allows me to send it side to side. Yeah. Right. Whereas before I'm relying on the differential. So now I can much more closely integrate with the vehicle controls and decide where I want the torque to go. A lot of vehicles that are out there right now use what they call brake based uh, torque vector. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. You know, if I want to send torque to one wheel, I break another wheel. In GKN, we think it's better. If I want to send torque to a wheel, let's yeah. send torque to the wheel. Yeah. All right. Rather than trying to, uh, you know, to trick it over there. Yeah. So in this case, you know, this system, you can feel it actually sending torque to the outside wheel. You know, as you're coming out of a turn, it's just it's, it makes makes a big difference, and you can program the car to do what you want it to do. Yeah. Uh, rather than relying on the reaction of the differential. So how closely did you work with Ford on that? Was it just uh, a case that you hand over the components? No, and no, no. It was go, extremely guys. intimate. It was okay. uh, a very big co-development. As a matter of fact, we won uh, an Automotive News Pace Award last year for our partnership with Ford okay. in the development of this vehicle. So, you know, Ford obviously owns the master controls, but really, yeah. you know, it was a, a great partnership, you know, getting the car to drive this way, uh, making this engaging and dynamic. So here is quite a good example because this corner wants to make the car understeer out, but you could just with a even just with a training throttle you can feel it start to pick up. And here you can turn into this corner yeah. and the car is just driving into the corner. How's it getting a little bit <laughs> <laughs> As promised. Yep. Um, so how's it doing now? Is that more from the rear axle or is it more from the front axle? It's almost, it's largely from the rear axle. Okay. So front wheel drive based car is going to understeer into the corners as you mentioned, right? Yeah. So with this one, what we can do when we send the torque to the rear, is send it to specific wheels, is create the yaw moment that makes the car feel like a rear wheel drive yeah. platform. And can that work on, on the training throttle as well as underpowered? Yes. Yeah. 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 So you can introduce on a training throttle, you can introduce a, a kind of braking. You could, yep. I'm not sure that we actually have that in this vehicle, but that's okay. something that could be done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things that I'm quite interested in is how the, the, some of the rivals are responding to this. Mm -hmm. So um, Mercedes AMG, for instance, they use a kind of Haldex type system yes. on their A45, which is you know, a rival product that's a bit more expensive. But they've seemingly they've responded by adding a mechanical limited set in the front. front. Yes, yes, they did. What, what are they yeah. trying to achieve with that? Well, it all depends. I mean. One of the things you always want to do is put all this power that you've got to the road, yeah. right? That's yeah. that's goal number one. Yeah. So who cares if I've got 500 brake horsepower if I can't get it to the pavement? Yeah. Uh, in the case of putting a limited slip in the front, you know that allows you to put more of that power power to the road. Okay. Now there are trade-offs with all of those. I mean, so as we mentioned before, a lot of people use the brake base to send the torque around. Uh, when you've got a limited slip in the front, uh, you've got I would say more throttle on understeer in the corners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, okay. or, and throttle off oversteer, you know, okay. coming out. So, you know, it's always a trade off how you want to set up your car, how you want it to feel. Yeah. Uh, but in general, I, I, I'm not a big fan of limited slip diffs in the front. Okay. Uh, Why I, is that? Just because I, I find it to be less engaging. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, really, the sweet spot is trying to do a uh, electronic control diff in the front. That is yes. really a good way to do it as well. Yeah. So, we're a bit like Volkswagen has yes. this yes. VAQ system. So. Yes. But with them, um, we'll go on to that in a second. But, but um, with the by putting a limit step diff on the front, so as I understand it, when you have it on the back end, on the rear axle of a rear wheel drive car, that is one of the reasons McLaren and Lotus don't have limit slip diffs, yeah. is that they think it introduces understeer as you. Well, and sometimes it can be a bit unpredictable, is my view as well. Right. You know, so. Uh, you know, when you actually control everything with clutches, you know exactly what's going on. Yeah. You know what the intent is, and you can send the torque there. So, but with a mechanical diff on the front axle, what effect does it have on, on turning? If you're off the throttle, does it have a? Does it help with the weight transfer and over the front wheels? Does it kind of have almost like a trail braking effect? It, it does a little bit, yes. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's just the way everyone expects the car to feel. Right? Yeah. So okay. whenever you're going to do something that makes it feel different, people either love it or they hate it. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess you're always looking at trade-offs. So, but with, with, if you put a limited slip diff on a Haldex type car, does that in effect make it feel more front-wheel drive? If you put the limited slip at the end, the front, absolutely yeah, yes. Because the yeah. front's going to do more. Yeah. yeah you're going to feel before exactly anything happens at the yeah. rear. But yeah. remember, with Haldex though, even with those systems, you still can send torque independently to the rear without a traction event. Right. So yeah, you know, you still can tune it to feel the way you like it. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. But inherently, it will have more more understeer. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. No. So with the VAQ system, 
which is obviously a, an interesting rival product. It's, a, it's the other way around to, to what, what this does. Does GKN have a, have a rival product for that, or are you developing one? Or you know, it's one of these things where we developed one quite a while ago, to be honest. Okay. I think everyone's been kind of tinkering in that space. Yeah. Uh, but we decided to focus our energy more on all-wheel drive okay. uh, and on this twin steer system. Yeah. So you see it launching in many, many vehicles all around the world right now. Okay. Uh, a lot with Ford. Well, this one with Ford, and then many of the GM vehicles that are launching also have this system. Right. Right. I mean, presumably there's, there's a whole load you can't tell us about. But uh, are there anything you can tell us about who are using it in a kind of performance? Uh, yep. The uh, they're not as much performance oriented as this okay. one, uh, but they're using performance aspects of it. You know, they do use uh, the clutches for yaw damping, they do use it for, you know, excellent traction, uh, for predictive handling. I mean, it just, it, it makes a big difference. It's on the uh, Cadillac XT5, the new one that just launched, their smaller okay. SUV. Yeah. Uh, it's on the Acadia uh, and some other vehicles as well. So, okay. uh, you know, and the other vehicle that's launching with this technology as well is the uh, Lincoln Continental. Okay. So that's actually bringing torque vectoring to the larger Lincoln vehicle right. to make it feel more sporty, more nimble, uh, you know, and just much more fun to drive. Okay. Okay. So um, we'll come back to this car now. So at what stage, what was your involvement personally with, with this system and this car? Unfortunately, I didn't get much wheel time because okay. I was just the boss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, it was a lot of the great engineers that, uh, that work in my team who spent a lot of time in the U.S. and in Germany, yeah. you know, on this vehicle. So, you know, a lot of the tuning, obviously, was done on this side of the pond. Yeah. Uh, and our team in Lomar really uh, was instrumental in GKN making this car a success. Yeah, yeah. So do you think Ford were kind of pleasantly surprised at, at what, what the system could do? What I think they were. The As a matter of fact, they kept... Uh, you know, turning the knob up a little bit each time too. Yeah. So they would say, all right, we want to have one lap around Nürburgring, and yeah. then it becomes two, and then we want to do this, and we want to do that, yeah. and you send more torque. So I think it was a good mutual exploration of what the technology is capable of, yeah. uh, and that really pushing the limits on what the car can do with it as well. Because we worked with um, Tyrone Johnson, have you worked with him? Because we met him, he's the project leader of this car. I haven't personally directly, right. but uh, okay. uh, another American. I'm sure the other guys have. Yeah, no, yeah. He, he was very, um, He's very straight talking, and he, and he knows what he wants. And he's, 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 he hates understeer. This, this is the thing. He, uh, That's, this is the enemy of understeer, so it's yeah, great. Yeah, no, he absolutely hates them. So we'll try a different. We'll try the twisty bit, and we'll try a different mode. So we're going to we're into racetrack mode now. So we're going to go back into this twisty bit. Okay. Um, what's it going to do differently? So you're in track mode right now. So I mean, yes. All right. Yeah, so what this yeah. does is, you know, obviously in the uh, normal driving mode. You know, you've got the car set up so it's, you know, pleasant to drive around the city. Yeah. You know, if you put it in sport mode, it's kind of, it's louder, it's a little tighter, it's great for country road driving. Now that you put it in track mode, it really tightens up the steering. Yeah. Makes the all-wheel drive much more aggressively engaged. Yeah. Uh, really kind of tunes down the ESP as well. So, so you're using uh, more of the uh, uh, traction from the Twinster. Yeah. Rather than having uh, ESP intervention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So is that by introducing the overspeed that you were talking about to the rear wheels? Yes. Yeah. And so you're using the all-wheel drive much more aggressively right now. Right. In the other modes, you know, you use it when it's needed or when you know, the vehicle feels like uh, uh, all-wheel drive would be handy for what you're trying to do. Exactly. We just felt it. Yeah. Just to, you yeah. Know, I had the same steering angle, but the car turned exactly into the bend, which is quite a weird feeling in a front-wheel drive car. Isn't it, it is. It is. Uh, it's something to get used to. Yeah. But it's yeah. something to uh, fall in love with as well. It's not Absolutely. one of these things where you have to uh, say, "Do I like this or not?" You, I think intrinsically we all know that's the way a car should feel when you when you drive yeah. like that. And yet it feels very different from a, a powerful rear wheel drive, yeah. well, doesn't it? It's a, it's a very different sensation. Yes. Because so, one of the things I've noticed when, I, when we have done the drift mode stuff is it's quite weird because you don't throw corrective lock. Yes. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's of, amazing how predictable the car is because you know all the software algorithms that are built into it. You know, it's trying. The car's always trying to figure out what you want it to do. Yeah. You know, it says, "All right, he's got this steering wheel angle, this throttle position." Yeah. Uh, but I sense this amount of yaw and in these wheel speeds. I think he wants this, so let's engage more all-wheel drive. Okay. To provide that better yaw. Yeah. Yeah. So let him go around there. We won't do anything. Very there. Um, and presumably you're, you're confident with the, the headroom in terms of the durability and, the, and the, the staying power of the clutch packs. Yes, yeah, to be honest, I mean, there a lot of work went into that. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, algorithms that go into controlling it as well, too. Yeah. So you can't, you know, it's got a self-protect mode. So if you were to go into a bunch of split-view launches, yeah. the vehicle would, you know, 
turn off the system for a little while to cool okay. it off. Yeah, just don't open the punches, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Or it would use a, a much reduced duty cycle. Yeah. So what it does is it, it knows how much power has gone through it. Okay. It knows how a person's been driving it. Uh, so it's got a thermal model. So we actually don't measure the temperature of the RDM itself. Yeah. But we model it and keep track of how much energy in, how much energy out. You know, what's the uh, the total use case? Okay. So that you can tell the system to either you know it's okay to keep going or yeah. it's time to back off for a little while. And is it a service item? Is it something that could be prepared? You can change the fluid. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, but that's you know most cars these days change the fluid or put a new part in is usually the way yeah, it goes. Yeah, but the actual friction parts, the clutch parts there. No, I don't believe we have any uh, service plans for those. No, okay, yeah. okay. And is there a kind of projected, well I guess as you say it depends on, on each individual car, but... Uh, but really Ford wants to make the vehicle lot, like last the, uh, you know, however long the driver wants to have it, so yeah. you know, I would say we're looking probably over 150,000 miles of the target life. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I'm intrigued by is that when, when we have driven this car on track, it seems to work its front tyres very hard. You know, you might expect if you're using lots of drift mode and going sideways that you're going to be using rear tyres, but it seems to work its front tyres really hard. Can you just explain why that might be? Well, still the majority of the power is going through the front. Yeah. And also when you're uh, driving it really hard, you are getting some brake-based traction control in the front as well, right. so that tends to really uh, beat on the tyres pretty good. Yeah. So is, is there a sense that you're also having to kind of, because of the setup of the car, you're kind of having to overcome the front axle before anything can happen from the rear? Is that so? Is that why it's working the front tire so hard? Or? Oh, actually, no. You don't have to overcome it. Can, okay. It, it'll tell it, uh, the vehicle decides when to use the all-wheel drive. It doesn't have to have any speed difference. Doesn't have to have anything like that. Right. So it's just the, it's just I guess presumably it's just the fundamental layout of the car it is and weight yeah the fact that the weight is out the front the yeah, majority of the power is coming through the front the uh, you know a lot of the, uh, the brake controls come through the front so. yeah because that seems to be we had that on the launch quite a lot we had it I think mean, we did three or four sessions on the track and after session three you know it, then, time for tires then it starts to understand <laughs> yeah uh, but I guess even with all the power going to the back you could, it, it would always eventually if you haven't got any grip on the front. Right. You can still go, but the problem is, you know, as you start to lose front tire uh, tire diameter, yeah. you know, you've got different speeds front to rear, and the, generally those things aren't good on the all-wheel drive. Yeah. So is there a potential for people to um, hack the system or tune the system? So, you know, if you were a, you know, a, a drift drift guy, could you, you know, can you lock it out so it almost went to a fully locked differential? Or, uh... There's, uh, clever people can do many things, <laughs> so I haven't seen it yet, but it wouldn't surprise me to see someone, you know, tinkering with the, uh, with the algorithms, with the controls, with the way the entire system works. It's, it's always a big risk in doing that, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oops, that, that Most of the time they set it up the way they do for a reason. Yes. You know, a lot of it has to do with safety. Yeah. There you go. I just love that little... It's, it's very subtle, but, you know, you know, people talk about the people look at the drift mode videos and all that kind of thing, but it's, it's that to me which is interesting about this car. It's not the kind of the wild tire smoke and right. all that kind of stuff. It's, it's the moments when, so here if I'm going to stick to my lane as if I were on the, on the normal road, I can just turn into the corner and it's still... You don't have to fight it, it wants to go into the corner. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't want to plow out. Yeah. So is this a vital part of turning Americans onto hot hatches, do you think, giving them a bit of rear-wheel drive, or were they receptive anyway? It is, I think, to be honest. It, it's interesting, the hatch market in the U.S. is always struggled. Yeah. I think because in the U.S. we kind of associated uh, small cars with inexpensive cars. Yeah. And in the U.S., many times inexpensive was cheap and bad. Yeah. Right, so it's trying to re-educate the consumer with cars like this, with cars like the uh, S3, yeah. things that people can get excited about and uh, get behind the wheel and say, okay, this car is small, but it's also great to drive. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's probably covered quite a lot of geekery. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to say thank you very much to Ray, and I think we're going to go and have some lunch. Thank you, it was a great time. And uh, maybe do a bit more driving as well. Perfect. <laughs>